Hello guys, welcome to TutorTube. Today we're going to learn about photography. So to learn about photography, we need to take a look at the technical aspects and the artistic aspects in photography. So in the first session, we're going to look at the technical aspects. So the camera that I have with me today is Canon EOS 750D which is an intermediate range camera. So we are going to focus on three of the features that this camera provides right here. So the basic features in a camera that we need to know about is the aperture which is denoted by A or AB in the camera dial. The letter V refers to value. Next one is shutter speed which is denoted by S or TV that also means time value where one is automatic while we choose the other and vice versa. Then we have the ISO which we can control from either of these modes. And finally the manual mode is denoted by an M so that we can control all of these three functions manually. One is the M that stands for manual mode, the other one is AV that's the aperture value and the other one is TV that is the time value. First of all we're going to start up with the aperture value right here. Aperture is a hole through which light passes into the camera sensor. The size of the aperture is measured using f-stops. The default f-stop for most camera lenses is 5.6. While measuring the f-stops, the lower numbers like 2.8 actually denotes a bigger hole size for the aperture while the higher numbers like 32 actually denote small aperture sizes. Apertures has direct effect on the depth of field of pictures. The more bigger the size of the aperture, for example aperture 1.8 or 1.4, the shallower the depth of field. That is, the subject of the camera stays in focus while the others are blurred out. And the more tighter the aperture, like aperture size of 22 or 32, the sharper the depth of field. Meaning everything stays in focus and the picture will have a sharp depth of field. It also determines how much light can enter into a camera. As it might seem obvious, the larger the aperture, the more light reaches to the sensor of the camera, thus producing brighter images. And the more tight the aperture is, it results in darker images and are usually only a preferred way of shooting outdoors in the daytime. So to test out the aperture function in this camera, I'm going to use this as the test subject right here. So let's get started. So first of all, I'm going to make sure that the zoom level is maximum. In this case, it is going to be 55. So I'm going to turn on the camera. I'm going to make sure that it is in aperture value mode. So I'm going to open up the camera viewfinder right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this subject right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one picture with the aperture value of 5.6. I'm using the dial here to change the value. Okay, so let me just click one. So that's the first shot with the blurred out background and then I'm going to dial this up into 32 in my second picture and let's shoot the picture and let's see the difference. And that's the second shot with a more clearer background as you can see there. So as you can see, the subject of both the pictures may be the same but in the first shot the main subject is in focus and the background is blurred out. This is the result of a bigger aperture size of f-stop of 5.6. In the second picture where the aperture has an f-stop of 32, you can see that the background is a bit clear in comparison. So if you have noisy backgrounds, you may probably want to use a shallower depth of field. Do note that you'll have to have in a zoom level of at least 50mm and up for this to work. So now we're going to look at what shutter speed is in photography. So uh, here's a video about shutter speed. Shutter speed, also known as exposure time is the length of time of exposing light to a camera sensor. It represents the time that a camera shutter is open for while taking a photograph. The amount of light which reaches the sensor depends on the exposure time. So we can say that more light reaches the sensor of the camera if it is open for 2 seconds compared to that open for only 1 second. But usually we do not open the camera shutter for that long while shooting a photo. The regular amount of exposure time or shutter speed is considered to be around 1 by 16th of a second or 1 by 18th of a second. 
It can even be more than one by eight thousandth of a second in professional cameras. The shutter speed is directly related with the motion blur that we get in a photograph. If we were to use a shutter speed of one by eight thousandth of a second, then everything will seem rock still and intact. If we lower the number for around one by two hundredth of a second, then we can see some motion blur when shooting fast-moving objects such as bikes or cars. And if it is lower than one by sixteenth of a second, we can even see blurriness in the motion of regular human movements of arms and legs. So now I'm out here in the open space so that we can test out the shutter speed. So I'm going to go over to that side where there's a lot of traffic so that I can show it to you guys how the things work. So I'm going to make sure that my camera is in a uh, like stable spot like this right here. So I'm going to open up the camera and make sure that I take three shots for the shutter. So I'm going to make sure that I'm on the time value mode while I take this shot. So I'm going to take one shot. So this is the first shot with regular shutter speed. You can see that there is a slight motion blur in the vehicles. And another one with a higher shutter speed. This is the second shot with a fast shutter speed and as expected everything is intact and seems still. And another one with a lower shutter speed. And finally the third shot with a slow shutter speed which has seemingly more motion blur to it. So now let us uh, see how the pictures turn out. So the first shot is shot at 1 by 18th of a second and you can see that there is only a slight motion blur in the car but other subjects seem fine. The second shot is very still and does not seem like anything is moving. This is the result of a fast shutter speed that is 1 by 500th of a second. In the third shot, with a shutter speed of 1 by 40th of a second, you can see that the motion blur of the car is very high. Usually while using a low shutter speed using a tripod, that is a camera stand is recommended. Otherwise the pictures will turn out blurry. If you have a shaky hand, using a high shutter speed will actually prevent you from shooting a shaky picture but it is only possible where there is plenty of light for the camera to capture. In low light situations however you are better off using a tripod. And finally we are going to talk about ISO which is the final technical feature we need to know in basic photography. The ISO represents the film speed. The control over ISO came with the invent of digital cameras. In all film cameras, the ISO was fixed with film reels that you got so you had to choose a film reel before you got to the location for shoot. But these days, we can control it directly from the cameras. ISO refers to the level of sensitivity of the camera sensor towards a light to capture while shooting a picture. It directly affects the exposure in a picture. We use ISO when we have to use certain aperture size or shutter speed but the light the camera sensor gets with those settings are either too much or too less for the camera sensor. The normal ISO level starts from 100 and it can increase all the way up to 12,800 in most of the cameras. New cameras even have ISOs up to 200,000. For well lit regular subjects, we use a regular ISO of 100 but in low light situations, we use higher ISO levels like 800. It is not a good idea to shoot a photo in more than an ISO of 800 unless there are no other options available at all. It is because the more the higher that an ISO level is, the more grainier the picture will be which directly affects the quality of the picture. So the maximum recommended ISO for modern day cameras is an ISO of 800 and in case of older models it is better to use an ISO of 400 only. So now we're going to focus on how to use ISO. So I'm inside a dark room right now and my and I have my ISO set to 400. Okay. So now I'm going to shoot one at 400. So as you can see in lower ISO the image looks dark as the camera is not sensitive enough for good brightness level of the picture. Okay. I'm going to shoot one in 1600. So this ISO level does increase the brightness a bit but you can see some noise in it. And one in uh, 12,800. And finally this level of ISO gives the picture a correct exposure but produces noise as you can see in the picture. Okay, let's look at the results. So if we compare these three pictures, the first shot is not usable at all as the camera sensor is not sensitive enough for the light situation. In the second picture you can see some noise although the picture is a bit brighter compared to the previous one. 
In the final picture, the exposure seems good enough and you may see that there is more noise compared to what other pictures had. So a higher ISO may give you brighter pictures in low light situations but it might result in noisy pictures. So it is suggested to use a higher ISOs only if no other options are available. So if you want to keep quality in mind, keep your aperture wide open and have a long shutter exposure time if applicable and use a maximum of ISO of 800 only to get quality pictures. So that's it for the technicalities of the basic photography. So now what we're going to do is we're going to be focusing on the composition part. So we're going to be focusing on four main basic composition of photography. The first one is simplicity and the second one is zoom. Third one is framing and finally we're going to look at the rule of thirds. So let's get started. In photography, there are many rules which we can follow to produce a good photograph. For the basics, we're going to focus on four rules. That is the rule of simplicity, frame, zoom aspect and rule of thirds. Rule of simplicity tells you to keep the subject backgrounds clear. Framing refers to your suggestions in a picture. Zoom aspect refers to the level of standard zoom level or focal length we need to shoot at for good visual proportion and the final rule of thirds which is the most popular rule of them all. It tells you to keep your main subject in intersection of a tic-tac-toe like shape. It is not compulsory to use all of the rules or use any of these rules at all but it is suggested that you use at least one of them for better results in picture composition. So the first rule that we're going to look at is simplicity. So let's see what it is. Usually when we shoot a photo, we usually focus just on the main subject and do not keep the backgrounds or surrounding elements in mind. We tend to love things that are clean in design and we are inclined towards things that look clear. Similarly, in a photograph, the rule of simplicity suggests that the picture should look clean. It is suggested to keep the main object away from distracting backgrounds and make sure that the backgrounds used are clean. While shooting regular pictures in studios for your passport sized photos, you may have probably noticed a white or a neutral color background. They are actually using the rule of simplicity to make sure that the pictures look clean and therefore looks professional. Usually in outdoor situations, we can use pictures of the sky for this if we are unable to find a suitable clean background. This rule is also applied by using a shallow depth of field using a big aperture size like 1.4 or 1.8 that blurs out the background and makes it seem as if they are plain. So for the rule of simplicity, I'm going to focus on this object right here. So I'm going to shoot it from two different angles. So let's start. So this is the first shot with a noisy background without applying the rule. And one from the other angle. And this is the second shot where we apply the rule so that the background looks cleaner. So if we were to compare both the shots, the first shot is where you do not apply the rule at all and the background seems very noisy. This actually results in a lot of distraction and the attention might not be towards the main subject in the picture. But in the second shot, we have a cleaner background and therefore you might notice the focus is directly on the main subject as there is no background element to distract us. The rule is beneficial while shooting portraits or small objects that is in macro photography. And now let's look at another composition that is important for photography and that is framing. Framing is used to give a viewer perspective of the main subject in a photograph. In framing, objects around the main subject are used to create a visual frame. It is also referred to as keeping suggestions which gives the viewer an idea on where the subject is. The frame does not have to be in a correct exposure and is usually darker than the main object in a scene. Common objects such as bars, fences, windows or doorways can be used as frames. Photos shot with framing gives viewers a sense of depth in a photograph as there is something in the foreground which the viewer can relate to with the main subject. Frame also leads the eye towards the main subject. Frames for photographs can come in all shapes and sizes. It does not need to go completely around the edges of your photos. They also can just be one or two edges in your shots. If you use this technique, you may also want to consider whether you want your frame to be in focus or not. In some cases, a blurred out frame, which you can achieve with a large size aperture like 2.8 or so, gives more value to a subject while in other cases, an in focus frame might add in more value to a photograph, which can be achieved with a tighter aperture of about 22 f-stops. So now for framing, I'm going to use this object right here to suit the buildings behind my back. So let's do that. 
As you can see in this photo, here the poles and wires have been used as frames. The main focus is towards the building where the viewer's eyes will lead to eventually. As you might also notice, the poles are underexposed and it does not really matter in this case as the subject is the only object that needs to have a correct exposure in this case. This is also another reason why the viewers will focus on the main subject and in this case, the buildings. It is suggested to use the method of shooting while doing art photography. But for regular shots, rule of simplicity is much more preferred. So now we are going to look at the zoom factor in photography. The zoom factor in photography is essential for the perspective of the overall shot. While shooting sceneries, we usually use a low zoom level, that is low focal length of around 18 to 16 mm of length. While shooting sceneries, it is the ideal focal length. However, if you want a fisheye effect, you can use lenses with focal length of 10 mm as well. But what we need to keep in mind is how our eyes see the world and how the camera lens sees the world is different. Our eyes have a spherical shape. So we do not have a flat perspective like a camera does. If we are seeing the pictures, we are seeing it from a camera lens's perspective. This might be okay for shots as sceneries, but when we shoot portraits, this does make a huge difference. If we want the same perspective of photos as perceived with our human eyes, we need the lens focal length to be in 50mm. So usually when we shoot a picture of a person, it is a good idea to go a bit farther away from the subject, use higher zoom level, that is more than 50mm focal length, to capture the image of the subject. So now we are going to focus on the zoom factor in photography. So I have my subject sitting right over here. So I'm going to shoot one picture up close and one from this side right here. So I'm going to go near close to him. So I'm going to make sure that the, the zoom level is in 18mm. That is the default zoom level in any kid camera lens. So I'm going to shoot one picture from this. So this shot is using 18mm focal length and as you can see that the facial feature of the subject is a bit distorted. Now I'm going to move a bit back and make sure that the zoom level is 55mm. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I get the same frame as I did last time. And then this is the second shot with a focal length of 55mm and you can see that the facial feature of this subject is in the same proportion as we naturally see it. So let's compare these two photos and find out which one is better. So as you can see that in the first shot, the face is out of the natural proportion perceived by a human eye. You can see that the nose looks very big and the ears are barely visible. But in the second shot, you can see that the proportion is good. Both the ears and the facial features have a good proportion. So usually when we shoot portraits or even group photos for that matter, using a bit of zoom is a good idea. You might lose some quality while shooting from a cell phone camera though, as it does not have a physical zoom, but it is still better than an odd proportion of facial features. So now we are going to focus on the rule of third part of photography. The rule of thirds is the most well-known composition principle in photography. It is the most common feature labeled as grid in most camera softwares to help the photographers follow the rule easily. The basic principle behind this rule is to break the image down into thirds, both horizontally and vertically, so that you have nine sections in an image, just like a tic-tac-toe game lines, overlaid on the top of the main image. As you are taking an image, in this grid you can see four intersection points where you are expected to keep the subject of interest instead of just simply placing them in the center. However, that's not all. If the subject is facing towards the right, we are supposed to use the intersections in the left, while if the subjects are faced towards the left, then we are supposed to use the intersections in the right. Similarly, if the subject faces towards the top, you are to use the intersections in the bottom portion, and if the subjects face down, you are supposed to use the intersections at the top. In addition, instead of just focusing on the intersections, you can also use the rule of thirds grid to place the main content in two grid spaces while you leave the third grid space as an extra space horizontally or vertically depending on the situation. Here too, you are suggested to leave an extra space where the subject is facing. And for that, I'm going to switch some sceneries. So let's head out for the scenery hunt. So I found some quite good locations over here. In my back, I got some buildings that I'm going to suit and in my front, I got some scenery. So let's use rule of thirds to take some snapshots. So I'm going to open up my camera. I'm going to make sure that I'm in my manual mode to suit the photos because I learned some technicalities over there. I'm going to suit some photo. So this is the first shot where the building covers the two horizontal grid spaces in the bottom. And one over here. 
and this is the second shot where the sky covers the two grid lines at the top. So now I'm going to go to the other area to shoot some more photos. So let's go. So now I'm going to shoot this building right here. And the third shot here, the building is placed in the top right intersection of the grid and since the building door is facing towards the left, we kept the building in the right intersection of the grid we shot and in the top intersection instead of the bottom one as we want to focus on the ground as well. So all of these pictures uses the rule of thirds grid in different ways. In the first shot, the viewer's eyes are directed towards the buildings as it covers more of a visual space than the sky. In the second picture, the sky covers more of the grid areas and the tower is placed on the left intersection of the picture. In this case, it does not matter which intersection we use for the tower as its direction is not distinct. And finally, the third picture where the top right intersection is used, both horizontal and vertical grid spaces are covered by the building in the right which gives the picture an interesting feel. If you were to see the most of the photographs in everyday magazines, newspapers and even TV shows and movies, the rule of thirds composition is found to be common among most of the shots. Hope you guys learned something interesting today. Please do like, share, subscribe and comment and keep on shooting.